What's so good about moral freedom? That's the question we'll be discussing with my guest, uh, Dr. Philip Swenson, a professor at William and Mary. Hi, thanks for having me on. You've been on once before to talk about Molinism, and you provided a dilemma for Molinists. I would encourage the viewers, go check that out after you've watched this video. But I recently came across a paper by Wes Morriston, and I thought I, it would be good to get your thoughts on it. And the title of that paper is What is So Good About Moral Freedom? And I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs here because it gives the, the sense of what he's trying to argue in the paper. And then you can respond. So he's, he writes, Many Christian philosophers believe that it is a great good that human beings are free to choose between good and evil. So good, indeed, that God is justified in putting up with a great many evil choices for the sake of it. But many of the same Christian philosophers also believe that God is essentially good, good in every possible world. Unlike his sinful human creatures, God cannot choose between good and evil. In that sense, he is not morally free. It is not easy to see how these fit together, or these two theses fit together in a single coherent package. If moral freedom is such a great good in human beings, why is it not a grave defect in God that he lacks it? And if the lack of moral freedom does not detract in any way from God's greatness, would it not have been better for us not to have it? Okay, so that's the gist of the dilemma. And if you want to add anything to it, you you may. And then I wanted to see how you might respond. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great dilemma. It's a great uh, challenge or question to ask of theists because, yeah, you know, theists do tend to say, uh, at least a lot of theists, when they respond to the problem evil, either that moral freedom itself is a great good, right? It's a great good to be able to choose between good and evil. Or um, uh, a view that I hold is that moral freedom is necessary for humans to achieve a certain great good. So I think uh, one of the reasons God allows evil is so that we can be responsible for making a positive difference in each other's lives. And if we didn't have moral freedom, the ability to choose between good and evil, we couldn't be significantly responsible for making a positive difference in each other's lives. Um, so then the challenge for someone like me or, or a whole lot of theists who say things like that is, well, if that's so great, why doesn't the God, the best possible being, have that? How can it be so good for us and it not be something that the best possible being has? So I think it's a great challenge. Um, if it's all right, um, I'll cover three possible responses. Two I reject, and the last one will be the one I prefer. Does that okay. sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, the first response is uh, kind of like one that uh, Morrison discusses himself. So this uh, is the claim that uh, humans need moral freedom to have significant moral responsibility, but God doesn't. So there's some difference between us and God such that God can be responsible for what he does, even if he can't choose between good and evil, but we can't. We need to be able to choose between good and evil to be significantly uh, responsible. So uh, one way you could develop this is to accept something that's called source incompatibilism. Uh, so source incompatibilism says, um, in order to be morally responsible, uh, you have to be the source of your action, right? Um, and they think that for humans, that means responsibility is incompatible with everything being determined ahead of time. Because if, if all of your actions were determined ahead of time, then they would say, you're not really the source of your actions, right? Uh, something outside of you, external to you, is the true source of your actions. So you're not responsible, right? Um, but you might think in the case of God, even if he couldn't do anything different than what he did, even if he has to make good choices, it's nothing external to God that's making him do that, right? God is uh, not dependent on anything outside of God. So the source of his action is still internal to God, um, even if, um, even if uh, he couldn't really uh, choose differently. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Do you get yeah. the basic yeah. idea? Yeah. So uh, Morrison gives a response to that that I thought was pretty clever. Um, so he imagines two groups of people the alphas and the betas, right? Yeah, I liked this part of the paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the alphas um, are people who uh, 
they are naturally good. They can't help but choose good, right? They don't have moral freedom. And they're, and the reason they're uh, naturally good is they were determined to be good by something outside of them, God or something like that, right? And then the Vedas are a group of people who just popped into existence, right? Nothing outside of them uh, made them be the way they are. They just suddenly appeared for no reason, right? A violation of the principle of sufficient reason, right? <laughs> they just appeared, right? But they're also naturally good. They can't help but being good. And Morrison asked, well, would you praise one of them more than the other? And I think the intuition is, no, it doesn't matter if something outside of them made it, them do it or not, right? Um, in my view, I wouldn't give either of them credit um, for being good. I might admire their virtue, but I won't give either of them credit because I think they both are just lucky to be naturally good. They're naturally good. They're unable to be bad. That's, you know, they don't get credit for that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and you might, and you know, you might think uh, similarly, isn't God just lucky to be good, right? It's, it's just like the Vedas, nothing outside of God made him good, but still he can't help but being bad. And that's not because of his own choices or anything. He's just lucky to be naturally good. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty good uh, response from Morrison on, on that one. Um, okay. So that's the first type of response that the that the theist could make but then he gives this this gives objection, that objection. And, and yeah thinking, i yeah. i find that pretty persuasive because i think uh you know of course you of course god isn't perfectly analogous to the vedas god god didn't pop into existence right god either always existed or exists timelessly or something like that but uh you know you might think none of those differences make a difference um that would matter for moral responsibility um, mm -hmm. so I, my intuitions are with morrison there Okay, so what's the second type of response that the theist okay, so could offer? The second one is a kind of radical response. Um, and this involves thinking about um, what the best possible being would be like, right? So if uh, moral freedom is really a great good or necessary for a great good, you might think, well, when we're imagining our best possible being, we should imagine like the best possible starting point for a being. And you might think, starting out, what's God going to be like? Is God going to be unable to choose evil? Well, if so, then he lacks uh, morally significant freedom, and that's this great good. So I, so this response says, actually, God could have been evil, right? So God's the best possible. God is, you know, God starts out as the best possible initial starting point for being. And because moral freedom is so good, that involves the possibility of being evil right mm -hmm. um so yeah someone might think that's what makes god so great is this is a live option for him but right. he never he never chooses to do evil that's why he's so great right right um so uh this is kind of a a radical view because it says god could have ended up evil and we're sort of just lucky that he chose to be good right or it's fortunate for us that he didn't exercise this power to be evil uh that he had um, what I, I'm not inclined to accept this view because I think um, when you're building your best possible being, the possibility of evil is a really big risk, right? Um, if God turns evil, that ruins everything forever, right? So I think being essentially good is a more important characteristic for the best possible being um, than uh, having moral freedom. So when you're imagining your best possible being, I think uh, you can't have both essential goodness and moral freedom. And which one's going to go? I think moral freedom should go because mm -hmm. it's just too risky, right? What if God turns evil? Well, everything will be horrible forever, right? Um, so that isn't a feature the best possible being would have. Um, so that's, that's I'm not inclined to accept that, but I think it's a way you could go if you really put a high value on, on moral freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the second type of response. So then yeah. the third type of response is the one, this is going to be the one that you favor. This is my preferred. Yeah. I wanted to put those out there because I think they're reasonable options, but I don't, prefer, this is the third one's the one I like the most. Um, okay. So the third, uh, the third response is to accept that humans have a good feature that God lacks. Right. So I think we have a genuine good feature that we 
are responsible for positive outcomes in a way that God cannot be because God lacks moral freedom, right? Um, so think about two people, right? So um, first imagine a naturally virtuous person like the alphas and betas we talked about, right? Somebody who just always does the right thing, all their character traits just naturally align where they always just want to do what's good. They're always helping people out and being being nice, but they have no temptation at all to evil, right? Or if they feel some desire to do evil, it's easily overwhelmed by their stronger desire to do good. So that's the naturally virtuous person. There's something very admirable about them, and there's a way in which they're very good, I think. Uh, but now compare them with what uh, Holly Smith calls the moral resistance fighter. So the moral resistance fighter is somebody who experiences lots of strong temptation to do evil, doesn't have a perfect character, really could get it wrong and fights and beats the odds and through, you know, through strength of will uh, chooses to do right. I think there's a sense in which the moral resistance fighter uh, gets more credit um, mm -hmm. for doing right than the naturally virtuous person because they had to overcome this difficulty and overcome this real possibility of, of going wrong. Um, so I want to say there's a sense in which the naturally virtuous person is better and more admirable. But there's also a different sense in which the moral resistance fighter gets more credit. So God is like the naturally virtuous person. Uh, but we, when we do well, are more like the moral resistance fighters. We overcome our temptation. And when we do, we actually achieve something different than a different good than God achieves. Now, you might wonder, well, why is this good? So maybe you agree, okay, that sounds like a good, but why would it be worth giving us that good if it's not something that God has, right? Why is it worth it? Why is it worth all the evil we get as a result for us to have this if it's not something the best possible being has? Well, I, there's a few responses I could give um, there. So first, it's less risky for us to have this good than it is for God to have it. Because if we go wrong, we don't ruin everything forever, right? God, uh, in his, you know, I believe that God is trying to find ways to minimize the damage from when we screw up, right? And, um, you know, he's working to make things right again um, in the long run, hopefully, when we screw up. But if God goes wrong, there's no, there's nobody beyond, you know, stronger than God who's like fixing the damage when God goes wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's one difference. Um, another, another thought here, here might be is even if this is a lesser good, um, sorry, my, can you still hear me? My light. Yeah, yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. Um, good. I haven't lost Wi-Fi then. Okay. So even if moral freedom is a lesser good than the goods God has instead, um, maybe it's good for there to be a diversity of goods, right? Maybe it's good for there to be some creatures who are naturally virtuous like God, but it's also, you know, but it's, it's, good for the world to contain both naturally virtuous creatures and successful moral resist resistance fighters. Maybe the com the diverse combination is add something of value to the world. Um, and a third claim um, I'm inclined to accept is that God has some leeway to choose which goods to pursue when he creates. Uh, I don't think there's a best possible world so I don't think God has to create only the best goods. Uh, he can choose to um, pursue goods, um, even if there's some other better good he could have created instead. So even if moral freedom is less of a good than, even, even if creatures like us are less good than some other uh, uh, naturally virtuous creature God could have created instead, maybe it's still okay for him to create us. He still needs a good reason to a, when he allows evils. So I don't think it's like anything goes. What happened scary. there? <laughs> Did your light go off? The power just went out in my building. <laughs> oh, is there severe? Is there like a severe There's weather a thunderstorm thing? happening? Yeah. Can should we continue? Is this okay? Or... Um, yeah, let's, let's finish this video at least. Okay. I'm sorry about this. Um, yeah, what's the third reason? Oh yeah. So it might be that this good is, a, is less good than, creating naturally virtuous people, but still it's okay for God to choose it. Um, so that's the third, the third reason. Okay. Um, okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting line of response. So it seems like the three types of response, the first one where you where one appeals to like this kind of source view of human freedom or of, I guess, moral freedom in general, that seems like it's trying to split the horns. Um, the second one seems like it's accepting the horn where you have to give up uh, essential, the essential goodness of God. Right. But the horn you, you embrace the other horn, which is we have something God doesn't. Yeah. 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 Exactly. We have a good thing. God doesn't have. But then you try to explain weird. why yeah. there are some reasons that that's a better choice than the other horn. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, I've enjoyed this. Uh, I, can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think if you accept this view, it helps with a certain aspect of the problem of evil. So there's this question. Why doesn't God, you know, God, it's good for people to be responsible for preventing evils, right? But why doesn't God just prevent all the evils himself and get all the credit himself, right? Uh, if you think God can't get credit in the way we can, that's a reason for him to pass the buck to us. Hmm. Because we, uh, you know, if, you know, if he's, it's, well, if I rescue the drowned person, uh, I won't get this type of credit. But if I pass the buck to Jordan and he rescues them, uh, Jordan can achieve a good that I can't achieve. Uh, so I think that, is one advantage of accepting uh, this sort of view. Mm. That's really interesting. Okay. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up there. I've got a link to Wes Morrison's paper in the description of the video. And you haven't published anything like a response to this, right? So um, I have a paper coming out in this volume on theological determinism where I defend the view that God isn't morally responsible. Uh, so it gets to this point. It gets to the third response that I gave here. Although my reasons are different, um, it gets to the same point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, maybe when that comes out, I can put a link to that volume in the description as well. Thank All you. right. Well, um, this is, I guess, the first Ask a Scholar question that I wanted to ask you about uh, concerning this paper by Wes Morriston. But in the next one, we'll discuss... Uh, this view that Evan Evan fails has that God could both could and should have created perfect creatures. So that's what the next video in ask this ask a scholar series will be. So make sure you check that out and thank you again, Philip, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>